Today's interview is about SPACs. Yes, those SPACs, that asset class that typified the investment speculative bubble of early 2021, a time when you know the riskier the stock, the more it went up. SPACs, like many other risk assets, have had a very challenging uh, past six months. But I want to dive deeper into them now because I think they're a little bit misunderstood. Uh, to be honest, they were on my shit list for a long time because of the speculation and the fervor and the promotional activity, you know, folks trying to take advantage of the liquidity situation. I'm not talking about investors. I'm talking about promoters who are talking to investors. Uh, but I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive now. The guest I'm going to be speaking to today understands the SPAC structure extraordinarily well. And I think we all will be well served by listening to him. But before we do, I want to just define a few terms. SPAC stands for a special purpose acquisition company. It is essentially a shell company that goes public and then does a reverse merger with a private company so that the private company can uh, have its own ticker and, and go public. This reverse merger is referred to as a DSPAC, uh, and the, the SPAC sort of changes its ticker to, into entirely new stock. Almost every SPAC is priced at $10, and it can be redeemable for some amount of cash, maybe $10.10, $10.20, cents, who knows? So in this way, it is like a bond. But then there is a date after which you can no longer redeem the SPAC for cash, at which point it no longer should be treated as a fixed income instrument. Shortly thereafter, the SPAC de-SPACs and, like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, flies out of its cocoon a brand new company with a brand new ticker, and it is in every way a stock. Before we get into the interview, I want to make you some money. Is that okay if I make you some money? Okay, good. The way I'm going to make you some money is I'm going to save you some money because on September 13th and September 14th, BlockWorks is hosting its Digital Asset Summit in New York yet again. And if you use the code GUIDANCE250, all caps, you can get $250 off your ticket. I will be hosting a macro conversation with Alfonso Pecatiello, Urian Timmer, Daniel DiMartino Booth, and Mike Green. That is just one of many conversations at DOS. The code is only active till Sunday, and the price will only go up, so it really makes sense if you're going to go to get tickets right now. Think the deals end there? No, 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 no. BlockWorks Research is the premier institutional crypto research product, and if you use the code GUIDANCE, all lowercase, you can get 50% off on BlockWorks Research. Our head of research just wrote a second quarter macro review of all that happened over the past few months. It is free, so if you click the link in the description, you can get that for free, and then use the code GUIDANCE, all lower caps, to get 50% off BlockWorks Research. Thank you. Or should I say, you're welcome. Today, I'm joined by Lewis Kamhi, a founder of RLH Capital. Lewis, great to have you on Forward Guidance. Thank you. Great to be here. Lewis, you, your fund invests in SPACs. And when I first met you, I thought I understood what a SPAC was, but I actually didn't. What I thought you invested in were DSPACs, but you actually invest in SPACs themselves. So these are special purpose acquisition companies. Uh, what are they and why are they compelling? Sure. And many people confuse them, including the media. So a SPAC is actually something that's more like a fixed income instrument. A sponsor raises capital, and the unique feature of it is they have a finite amount of time to do a deal, and if they don't, they have to return the capital. And at the time of announcing the deal, there's a vote set, and at the time of the vote, investors have the choice between staying in the deal or getting their money back. And so you always have that option before the deal closes to get your money back, creating a floor. And so if you buy a SPAC below the trust value, you are always guaranteed a positive return. It's kind of boring. It's really, you know, simple, not exciting, but that's really what a SPAC is. Now what a DSPAC is, is when that SPAC closes its transaction and trades like any other stock, that's a DSPAC. And so when you hear on CNBC that they're bashing SPACs, they're not talking about the stuff I look at where there's a floor. They're talking about some of the electric vehicle deals and, you know, few, almost any deal, candidly, it's not one industry, but you know, SPACs, just like all new issue IPOs, you know, they've really underperformed over the last year. And that's what they're talking about. And so people confuse that terminology quite a bit. Yes. So if people, you know, there's so many uh, high flying names of 2020 and 2021 that de spac shot up in value and have really crashed extremely hard. You know, we're talking things, something went from $10 to $30 to $1. And so people look at that and say, wow, SPACs have performed really badly, but actually it, it's the de spac that performed after it 
changed names. Uh, and let me let me just give a little bit of, of context. So there's an IPO, initial public offering, where you know I have a company and I go to a bank and they raise equity for me and they sell it. Uh, then there's a SPAC, which is a blank check company goes public. Uh, IPO a let's just you know I, I, some sort of acquisition company uh, and then they do a reverse merger with my company so that's how my company and that that is called the the D SPAC uh, so you are not buying the thing at ten dollars and holding it until it goes to thirty or, or holding it until it goes to one you mainly in your fund are buying it at nine dollars and ninety eight cents and collecting the ten dollars and ten cents in trust right so for me the home run scenario is you know let's pretend there's ten dollars in trust. I'm buying the unit at, you know, let's call it 990. So I know everything goes wrong. I get 10 bucks back. I make a percent. But in part of the unit, you get a warrant. And so if a deal is completed, you know, I can still get my $10 back, make my percent. And then whatever value is ascribed to that warrant, that's the gravy. And what you saw in, let's call it better market conditions. And when I say better, I'm not talking about, you know, the craziness of early 2021. I'm talking even earlier this year, that warrant would be worth around a dollar when the deal closed. And so if you, for the sake of argument, assume that, you know, the average SPAC unit has half a warrant, you know, so then I make my 1% going from 990 to 10, and then my half of a warrant worth 50 cents, that's another 5%. So I've just made 6% on the upside and my downside cases, I would have made one. And so it's a, you know, obviously an asymmetric risk reward in that your downside case and your upside case are positive. And then what a lot of strategies and funds do like mine is you put a little leverage on that given that asymmetry. And so on a levered basis, you can have a, a pretty attractive equity type return on the upside and have a fixed income type return on the downside. Right. And again, on that downside, the reason is because you are redeeming your shares and getting that $10 back. You are not Converting your shares. A, a lot of the risk, uh, Lewis, and you know, I, I hope you'd agree, has been in, in the, after the DSPAC. Once it DSPACs, some of these companies are going from you know ten dollars to six dollars from in a, in a matter of days. Uh, do you th would you characterize? You know, to me, it seems uh, somewhat uh, bubbly. You know, there's a lot of financial, there's a lot of liquidity that sloshed around the, the global markets in 2020 and 2021, and that raised asset values. And I would say SPACs are definitely a field that benefited from that. And, you know, they attracted some types of companies that maybe were not the best companies. Would you say that's a, a judgment or a, a, a how, how would you characterize my, uh, I, would, I would call, assertion? I would call that pretty factual, but I, I would call out a few distinctions. One is, you know, and, and we've spoken about this before, it's not really SPAC versus, you know, you see a lot of these comparisons between SPACs and the S&P or SPACs and the Russell. And, and I don't think that's the right comparison. I think, you know, you have this issue with all new issuance, right? So I think SPACs versus IPO are more relevant. And, you know, what the market liked, you know, a year and a half ago were these VC type investments, like show me electric vehicles. Like we know Tesla dominates the space. A lot of value has been created there. So who's next? And you know, Nikola, which was famous for being pointed out as a fraud, but when Nikola came out, the stock went from 10 to 80. And if you're on the sideline as a sponsor, you're seeing, wow, like this company doesn't really exist yet, but this is what the market wants. Let me give them what they want. And so when I kind of look at DSPAC performance is bad. IPO performance is bad. VC performance is bad. All of those things I think are, you know, more, more comparable. And the other thing I'd point out is, you know, when you compare you know, if you compare Lucid, which was a big SPAC EV deal to Rivian, which is a big EV IPO, the performance is the same. When you compare Telemed, which is a telemedicine company to Teladoc, the performance is the same. It's terrible, but it's understandable. And, you know, we spoke about, you know, there, one of the other dynamics here is, I always say SPACs are a bull market product. And everyone says, well, obviously. And I say, no, like the reason you're thinking and the reason I'm thinking are a little different, like, yes, bull market where any deal is well received, that's great. But the average SPAC right now takes about four to six months to close their transaction. And so if you look at a deal today and then go back four to six months when it was announced, I can guarantee you that the peers were all trading higher and the market was all trading higher. And yet there's no mechanism to adjust that valuation. Now, sometimes sponsors do it voluntarily, but you know we were talking about something like Pagaya. You look at you know yeah. Pagaya and 
dropped to 250 and now it's all over the place on some short squeeze dynamics, which we can talk about later. But, you know, you look at some yeah. of the peers yeah. that Pagaya showed in their investor deck and they're down between 60 and 90 percent. So, you know, to me, that justifies the stock falling 75 percent. It's not an idiosyncratic issue. It's that this is where the market's at valuation should go for these types of companies. And so, you know, in a bull market, over those four to six months, markets are going up. So you're accreting value. And so, you know, you bought something for $100 and maybe that's worth 103 at close and you've created that value. Here, you know, the market's down 25% on the year. So if you announce a deal on Jan 1, all things being equal, you know, the stock should be down 25%. There's no mechanism for that to happen because of the trust floor. And so what you happen is as soon as redemptions fall through, again, absent some short squeeze dynamics, you know, you usually have that catch up. Lewis, I just want to revisit a point that you made earlier about Nikola. So this stock went from $10 to $17 to 5 There was this huge retail fervor. It attracted a lot of short sellers who said it was a fraud, said that the truck wasn't actually moving. It just rolled down the hill. You're saying if, the, if Nikola IPO'd or Nikola did a direct listing, the result would have been very much the same and that it doesn't matter by what means a speculative company gains financing. The, it's, if there's speculative further that crashes, that's going to happen no matter what. I mean, look, there were plenty of high profile IPOs and direct listings that haven't done well, right? Coinbase, Robinhood, Upstart, you know, these were non SPACs, but they look just like them. You couldn't tell the difference. If I showed you, you know, if I, if I picked a speculative industry and I just showed you uh, unlabeled charts, you wouldn't be able to tell one, one stock from another. And so it's just, you know, I, I don't think it's the wrapper. I think it's the, you know, the, if I put on my old Citadel hat, it's kind of the factor allocation to this unprofitable, high growth, highly speculative tech. <laughs> right. And yeah, Lewis, where does all this stuff come from? So let's say a BuzzFeed is a perfect example. You know, everyone knows the BuzzFeed company. It was a high growth company, big company, prominent company, but you know, like it's not a profitable company. Let's just put it that way. And uh, by the time it announced, between the time it announced a deal and the time the deal closed, you saw a lot of market volatility in, in earlier in this year. So the stock went from $10 to $2 pretty quickly. And people who had the SPAC uh, a share, $10, like something like 95, 97% of them redeemed for this very reason. So when 95, 97%, so you buy a SPAC, let's say, Lewis, you buy a SPAC and I buy a SPAC and the deal doesn't look so good. So we redeem our shares. How does the SPAC fund the deal? So in some cases, there's a pipe or some alternative capital. What you're seeing more and more are these creatively structured pipes. It could be anything between the pipe being issued at a lower dollar amount versus $10 a share, or it's in the form of a convertible bond or convertible preferred stock, so offering some downside protection. But that's one Sorry, common kind. Pub, uh, public and private investment in public equity? Yeah. And so the yeah. way that works is you get some institutional investors to come in, and their shares usually can't trade for about two months after the deal closes. They have to register the shares. Um, and so, you know, previously, so if you go back in SPAC history before the, the big bubble in 2020, 2021, pipes weren't a very common feature. Um, but, you know, what happened is all these deals started popping like an IPO pops. And so bankers and sponsors realized like, hey, we can get committed capital and institutional investors are going to be thrilled because they know they're investing in 10 and these things are going up to 14. And then you add to that, that as a retail investor, you would look at that and say, Tiger's investing in this deal. It must be good, right? You, you kind of get that stamp of approval. Um, and then what happened was <clears throat> these investors got stuck in these. They viewed it as like an IPO pop, but didn't take into account, you know, these deals can take five months to close. You know, what could happen is you could trade up to $18. You can't sell any of your stock. And then it sells back down to 10 between the deal closing and the piping registered. It falls further and you've actually lost money. And that happened to a lot of investors. And so the prominence of pipes, especially big pipes, have, has really declined. And now you see more of these structures offering downside protection or better entry points. In a lot of cases, you're seeing no pipes at all. And the SPAC is basically saying that wherever we trade to, we're going to issue capital at that price, right? They, they're public. They can issue shares. And so, again, like that, that could work for the business because the business may need capital. And I've spoken to some private companies that have said, look, we understand that the, the market provides price transparency. And so we're happy to go through a SPAC. And if we trade down to 
you know, five or six and we have to issue capital there, so be it. It'll suck, but we're confident in our business plan. And if we do this right now, then in two to three years, no one's going to remember that we had to issue at five. And so a lot of it is just understanding kind of the different incentives involved in the transaction. Okay. So the pipe supplies some capital. What about the sponsor? What does that mean? A, a SPAC sponsor? That's like a bank, right? They make the deal happen. It's not a bank. It's it's a private investor. They put up some money. And so the way it used to work is on average, they would put up 2% plus $2 million. So pretend you're raising a $200 million SPAC, 2% of 200 million is 4 million bucks plus 2 million is six. So they would end up with uh, investing $6 million. And in return for that, they would end up, <clears throat> they would take a 20% stake. And so, you know, roughly, it's actually a little more, but roughly $40 million. And so you put in six, you get a 40 million stake in the good old days when SPACs were trading up, you know, that 40 could have quickly turned into 60. And so the returns on your sponsor investment were tremendous. In theory, your job as a sponsor is to work with the banks to raise, to find a deal and raise capital to support the deal. But what you're seeing more and more is, you know, they're not bringing that added capital, right? There's no pipes. And, you know, if you're a sponsor that has their own capital, like a private equity firm or a hedge fund, very different, you know, value proposition you can offer a target than if you and I had a SPAC and, you know, maybe we could find a deal, but, you know, we don't have, well, I'll speak for myself. I don't have a hundred million dollars to put up in a pipe to, you know, assure capital. I just want to ask you, can we give examples of why the SEC is getting involved? Because yes, so many examples of IPOs, direct listings that have not done well by investors, but with SPACs, you know, you, you are seeing the, you know, the disclosure is a lot uh, more uh, um, loose, loosey goosey. Like, you know, QuantumScape can, if they do, if QuantumScape had done an IPO, I don't know if they would have been allowed to say, oh yeah, in 2026, we're going to do 600% increase in revenue. They have no revenue now. And they didn't had no revenue in, when they did, did it in 2020. I'm going to push back on you there. Sure, please. So the, the dirty little secret of IPOs is you're right. You cannot disclose forecasts in a prospectus. You won't find them. Um, but the way it works is so, I don't want to call out a broker in case they're they're listening to your podcast, but Bulge Bracket Bank gets hired to do the underwriting. They put their research analyst on, you know, on the deal to learn about the company. The research analyst comes out with their forecast. Usually that's done in conjunction with the CFO of the company. And while the bank is not allowed to email out those forecasts, they're allowed to give you those numbers over the phone. And so a lot of my time on the institutional side, you know, you call your salesperson, they're doing the IPO of X, Y, and Z. You say, okay, great. Can you give me the revenue and EBITDA for the next couple of quarters or the next few years um, and other KPIs. And I'll go from broker one to broker two to broker three. And all of a sudden I have a consensus, right? It's not on Bloomberg, but I can get it because I work at an institutional investor um, and any hedge fund or mutual fund can do that. Retail cannot do that. So I'm a big fan of democratizing access. So saying like, oh, there's a forecast issue, like that's not true. Like institutional investors come up with their price targets. They use multiples on key metrics. And those metrics in a lot of cases are coming from the company indirectly, right? Not directly. And so when everyone says like, oh, there's a real issue with, um, you know, forecasts and SPACs, I actually disagree with that because I've been on both sides. Would I like SPACs and their sponsors to be held more accountable to those forecasts? Absolutely. And by the way, you know, in traditional M&A, and this is where the practice comes from, in the proxy, you have forecasts. And so if you look at a public company buying another public company, those target financials are usually public in the proxy. And I haven't seen this, maybe it exists, but I haven't seen an analysis that shows how accurate those forecasts were versus overly bullish to get a better price. But that aside, so, but, so that you're right, that is an issue on the disclosure, but I always want to make the case that you need to understand both sides. And the other is if the underwriters have liability. And the reason you don't see projections in the, in the S1 for an IPO is because that would create liability for the underwriters. And so right now you've seen Goldman Sachs and Citigroup and a lot of others taking a step back saying, we're not going to participate here until we can really ascertain our liability. And so that's why 
this period of uncertainty until the SEC sets the rules is just tough for SPACs, right? You have a, a finite life vehicle in a period of uncertainty. You know, Wall Street always figures out how to adopt to new rules. So I think, you know, they'll they'll figure out how to go on from here, but you can't adopt to the new rules until there are new rules. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so you're saying that, so the QuantumScape, it's backed and, and it had its uh, investor presentation where it says zero revenue for 2020, zero revenue for 2021, zero revenue for 2022. 23 a little bit, 2024, 2025, 2026, we're growing 600% year over year. So you're, you're saying that if, if QuantumScape had IPO'd, that wouldn't have been in the disclosure, but it would have been heard over the phone. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you could make an argument, but, the regulators can't, don't seem able to make up their mind between, do we need want to protect retail and therefore not let them into anything? Or do we want to give them access, right? And so I think it's a really interesting topic um, unfortunately, probably more than we can cover in the next couple of minutes. But, you know, you could say that, well, institutional investors are capable of taking those risks and should be able to underwrite them better than retail. But then you have this issue of, well, it's not fair that institutional investors get first crack at the apple and all that money that's made on day one of the IPO. Or like talk, let's talk about venture capital, right? Venture capital has made a ton of money lately. The amount of money made in A and B rounds has been tremendous up until lately, right? And so you would have retail complaining, well, retail can't invest in that. So you are, you know, not providing us with this really attractive opportunity. And then SPACs provided it for a little while. And by the way, when SPACs were hopping, so was VC. And now they've both crashed together. There's a refinitive venture capital index on Bloomberg. It's down 75% of the year. And so... At some point, what we need to hear directly from the regulators is them saying, no, retail is not capable of doing their own homework and you know, investing in these high risk situations. And therefore it has to be all institutional or they are. But in my opinion, you can't have it both ways. What about forbidding disclosure uh, on, on written documents? Sorry, I, I like um, revenue forecasts, like it is for IPOs. I prefer in both IPOs and SPACs if it was written down. I just want management to be accountable. If you want me to, you know, look at your 2025 and 2026 and value you off that, and you want to get rich off of hitting or beating those numbers, I have no issue with that. My issue is, you know, you know, a lot of SPACs put out that forecast and then the sponsors are cashing out, you know, three months later. Like that's not well aligned. If you look at, and this yes. is done terribly, but if you look at something like Grab, that had a tier one sponsor, you know, if memory serves, they lock themselves up for three years. So, you know, at least in that situation, you feel like, all right, you and I were going for the same ride. You may be in at a lower basis because of your, uh, you know, your sponsor shares, but you're not going anywhere in three months. Like something like that makes a lot more sense to me than, you know, or said another way, you take your sponsor promote and you structure it so you only get 80% of it if you hit your out-year numbers. You know, if that's what I want to see. I want to see just better alignment. But in right. my opinion, more information you share with me, the better. All right. So, Lewis, where do you see the SPAC space going? Because you had so many deals in 2020 and 2021. And as you say, liquidity is drying up. Not as many deals are being done. How do you sort of see this SPAC world playing out? So, the median SPAC has a maturity of seven months from now. So, we're going to hit that wall. And there's over 500 SPACs looking for a target right now, which is just far too many. So I think we're going to see a healthy number of liquidations. Um, I personally would rather see a liquidation versus a, a bad deal. Uh, obviously, SPAC sponsors are not incentivized that way. But I think what's going that to happen- That is a key point. Is, yeah. If you're a SPAC sponsor, your bread is buttered by doing a deal, even if it's a bad deal. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So let's take a step back and say, why do we have 500 plus sponsors? Because SPACs were super hot and- all these banks started just finding people to, you know, create their own SPACs. And I would argue most people with SPACs right now don't have the skill set to do a deal and raise their own capital in a good market, let alone a challenging market. So you're probably going to see a lot of SPACs liquidate over the coming months. I still do think deals will get done. I had an interesting call with a private company and they said, look, the IPO market is essentially closed. The VC capital market is really tight. A lot of loan to own type stuff. So the SPAC market is actually my only way to go public and raise capital. So it's kind of interesting. And 
if we had 100 to 200 SPACs, I would tell you that's a great recipe for good deals, but I st still think there are too many and you get these SPAC off. So I think we need to shrink to grow. I think we'll shrink a little bit. I think you'll only see kind of more of the tier one players with access to good deal flow and capital and they'll, they'll do smart things. I think, you know, I may be biased because I have a fund that focuses on this, but I think the SPAC itself is a good product. I think the rules need to get better and the regulations better, but I also think the way the SEC doing it is not right. And it shows more either they don't understand the product or they just want to kill the product. I am sensitive to your point, Lewis, that a lot of the poor performance in DSPACs can be attributed to other factors that it resembles VC, their unprofitable technology stocks. Like, you know, I don't think there are really any energy SPACs. I mean, maybe there's one or two, but if certainly an oil and gas discovery company had de-SPAC'd and, and tons of those, the, the de-SPACs would be doing better. Oh, 100%. And it's really interesting you say that. Like There are a couple of SPACs out there now that have a mandate to find an oil and gas asset. And I think if they do, like that makes perfect sense. And if, But if you brought an oil and gas asset public 18 months ago, you know, in an environment with no redemptions, you probably would have had 100% redemptions. And so what, you know, something you recently saw that I thought was interesting is... Um, so Paul Ryan SPAC, um, and I have to remember the. Yeah, yeah. Well, while you say, Lewis, I'll just say this is a feature of SPACs that to me stood out. Like Paul Ryan has a SPAC. You know, maybe Alex Rodriguez had a SPAC. Shaquille O'Neal, I think, had two SPACs. It's like it attracted all the celebrity and all this hype. Oh, I, uh, my good friend is the CFO of uh, the SPAC that Alex Rodriguez is part of. So I, I go out of my way to not look at it and not trade it because. Not that I know anything, but I just, you know, you, you never want optics to complicate a situation. Right. But Paul Ryan, you know, no view of him as a politician here, but, you know, they did a SPAC to merge with some energy assets. And I'm not smart enough to tell you if these are good or bad energy assets or not, but their deal structure was really smart, in my opinion. So energy, so they, they picked the right sector. ENPC is the, the ticker, by the way, Executive Network Partnering. Um, so they did an energy SPAC, which makes a lot of sense. The business is cash flow positive with a pretty clean balance sheet, and they forfeited a lot of the sponsor promote. And so all of a sudden you look at that and you say, oh, like whether there's high redemptions, doesn't matter, no pipe, doesn't matter. It's the right sector. It's easy to get behind. Like they forfeit a lot of their promote, so it's not as dilutive to merge with the SPAC. Like, that's very logical. That makes sense. And I would hope that you see more of that. And there are a couple of SPACs, like I said earlier, out there that have that mandate to do energy deals. Like there's one that, you know, came out and said at the time they wanted, to, they didn't have any warrants. They only wanted to have rights. And they said, our goal is to buy an upstream energy asset with a 10% dividend yield. And you can't have a 10% dividend yield with warrants because of how the warrant agreement is structured, which I'll save that technical explanation for another time. And so they came out and because they have no warrants, you can argue that that's an attractive partner to merge with. And, you know, maybe they find a deal, maybe they don't. Obviously, if they don't, you know, you'll get your, your trust value back. But if you believe them that they can create a $10 yield, or sorry, that they can create a 10% yield on a $10 stock, so a dollar dividend, well, if you want to speculate a little bit, you could buy those rights today for pretty darn cheap and, you know, that's a home run trade, but again, your risk case is zero. Right. So how would you characterize the current investment opportunity set within the SPACs? It's, it's my understanding that, you know, owning a SPAC that de-SPACs and then holding it to, to maturity or whatever, that can be very risky and definitely has not paid off. It's, you know, you've been punished for that for the past six months. What is sort of a more responsible strategy that you employ and, you know, where are you seeing the opportunities? So let's go from least risky to more risky. And I'm going to do it in my universe, which means I'm assuming you're not staying past the deal closing. So the absolute lowest risk strategy you can employ is you just buy SPACs at, you know, a 3% yield to maturity and you do nothing but plan on redeeming them. And so right now the median SPAC trades at about 3% yield. Um, most SPACs invest their trust proceeds into treasury. So with rates moving, should get a little bit of a boom, but you know, let's, you know, with seven months on average, you know, we're, we're not talking about much, maybe, maybe an extra percent out of it. So let's say 4% and you're going to now earn 4% on a short-term investment with no credit risk at all. And you have upside that they announce a deal, the deal comes to vote sooner than that. So you could redeem. So you're still earning your same 
percentage, but over a shorter period of time. So higher annualized returns. So that's the absolute safest. You know, you're three to 4% locked in. You'll sleep at night. Not exciting, right? And so it really depends on what is your cost of capital? What are you trying to achieve? So that is the safest. The next safest is you can buy a unit of a SPAC and a unit is one share and a fraction of a warrant. And similarly, you would buy, you can buy a unit below trust value to give yourself that downside protection. But instead of getting, you know, 3% downside, you know, it's probably closer to one to one and a half. So lower downside. Now, if the SPAC does no deal and liquidates, you make that one and a half percent. If a SPAC does a deal, you know, now all of a sudden your warrant has, is going to be ascribed some value. And so you have more optionality embedded in that warrant. Now, what I was saying earlier is those warrants used to be worth on average a dollar. In fact, if you believe a SPAC can hold at 10, that warrant should be worth a little more than two bucks. But recently you're seeing these warrants trade more at 50 cents. Now, some of that is tied into this dynamic we just spoke about where you know, valuations are down so much over the last six months. So that, that well, you know, structured deal at, on, you know, January 1st now looks like you're overpaying. And so you can argue that new deals should trade a little bit better, but so let's call it 50 to a dollar. Let's say you get half a warrant. So that's an extra two and a half to 5% on the upside plus your, let's call it 1%. So now you're, you know, three and a half to 6%. Again, no risk, right? 1% down. So, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, Lewis. This, this is a um, little complicated. So I just want to give some clarity. So oh, when you buy a unit, you get half of a warrant and a warrant is essentially a kind of a stock. Each unit's a little different. Uh-huh. You have to read, you know, are you getting a whole warrant, half a warrant, a third of a warrant, three quarters. So you you need to look, it's on page one of the prospectus. Um, and so it's, it's pretty easy to, to find that out, but you, you need to be an informed investor and know like, what is my unit? What do I own? Yes, you definitely, this is a field that definitely rewards uh, f- thorough research. Um, all investing rewards thorough research, but but this especially. So you get a fraction of a warrant and a warrant is a kind of an option, but it it uh, decays slower. The, the stri- and the strike price is typically $11.50, not always, but typically, right? Yeah. And so that's why you said it makes sense for it to be worth $2. So with the time value of, of uh, intrinsic value of $1.50 and then time value, you get some, some applied volatility, whatever. So there's no price discovery in the SPAC itself. That's $10, 99 $10.20, whatever. There's no price discovery. In a rare case where it trades at something like 11, that's price discovery, right? If it's trading above trust value, it's price discovery. If it's not, then it's not. And one of the things I do a lot is I use the warrants to kind of inform my view on the price discovery of the underlying stock, which we can talk about a little later if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, let's do that right now. You say uh, warrants are the truth. Why is that? Sure, so, you know, like you were saying, warrants are five year duration. Uh, Generally speaking, it's the right to buy a stock at $11.50. And unlike, and so if a SPAC doesn't do a deal and liquidates, if you own the SPAC, you get trust value back. If you own the warrants, they expire worthless. So much riskier security. Similarly, they don't have that downside trust protection. And so where they trade is as an equity or a derivative would, not a fixed income security. And so what you can do is, and I'll, I'll save your viewers the time because I've done it. Uh, you can actually prepare a regression of yeah, where yeah. D-SPACs trade. So former SPACs of closer deals versus where their warrants trade. And what you'll find is there's something like a 90% plus R square. Um, and so, you know, from my point of view, so that's how I come to my, that conclusion that, so if I run that regression, it'll spit out that at $10, a warrant is worth, you know, low twos, let's call it. Now, so if I see a warrant trading at, you know, 225, it tells me, oh, you found my slide. There you go. So if I see a warrant trading at, you know, 225, it tells me that, all right, this SPAC maybe hangs out around 10, but in a lot of cases, you'll see the warrants trading at 50 cents, 40 cents, a dollar. And, you know, in those cases, it's basically telling you that this SPAC is going to trade down. Now, again, we've been carving out short squeezes and I'll continue to do so here, but it's usually a pretty good read through if you look at you know, 
if you're looking at a deal that's getting ready to close and maybe the stock's trading at 10, but the warrants are trading really cheap, your first impulse may be, wow, these warrants are really cheap. But in reality, it's the stock that's expensive and price action usually converges towards the warrants, not the other way around. Yes, I just want to highlight a point you made. So a SPAC is kind of like a convertible bond. It has elements of a fixed income instrument, but also an equity, whereas a warrant is just a derivative. It's a equity option uh, slightly out of the money. So it makes sense why we'd have that price discovery uh, on the warrants, right? Exactly. And, and so, Lewis, what about the opportunity set of saying, okay, the SPAC is at $10 and the warrant is at $0.30. Cents. So everyone thinks that this deal is is not going to happen. Why? What if you buy the warrants and short the SPAC? So unfortunately, shorting SPACs has, has been a bit of a challenge because of the higher redemption rates. So if you go into the deal vote and you're short a SPAC and there's higher redemptions, and you know when you short a security, you're borrowing it from someone who's long it. If that long redeems their security, your borrow gets pulled. And in a world that we've seen lately with 85 to 95 percent plus redemptions. It's really hard to stay in it. So you sell the call options instead, call spreads? Sometimes. I mean, a lot of times you don't even have that that opportunity. But if we look at something like Founder SPAC, F-O-U-N, they've already set their vote date um, and the warrants are trading at 22 cents. So you could read this in one of two ways or really one of three ways. And the answer is probably three. But one way is the market doesn't believe this deal is going to close and therefore those warrants are going to be worthless. Two is the market thinks this deal is a disaster and the stock is going to absolutely implode. And so to put it in perspective, warrants at 22 cents, I'm just going to pull up real quick what this uh, regression implies. Warrants at 22 cents implies a stock price of around a buck. And so, you know, you're looking at one case where the market thinks no deal and another case where the market thinks it's falling 90%. The, the real answer is it's probably somewhere in between, right? You could argue the market's describing a, I'm making this up, 50-50 probability that it's worthless. And so therefore, you know, the way to read 22 cents is really 44 cents, which, you know, again, is not, isn't great because it means, you know, the stock's worth in the threes, but not quite as bad as being worth a buck. Lewis, you said that a, a twenty cent warrant implies a share price of a buck. Um, what does that mean for? But aren't 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 Lewis aren't warrants sometimes redeemed themselves? Yeah. So <clears throat> there are two scenarios where you tend to see warrant redemption. One is forced, and one is an exchange offer. So in the forced case, most warrants have a provision in their warrant agreement that says if the stock is over $18, the company can force you to exercise your warrants. They, there's all, and so to exercise your warrants, you would pay eleven fifty, dollars and you would get stock. Some warrant agreements also have a provision where if the stock is over $10, then they can force you to redeem your warrants for stock. So instead of getting cash for it, you would get a fixed number of shares based on a, a table that's in the warrant agreement. So those are kind of the, the forced cases. Now, with not a lot of SPACs trading even above 10, those happen a little more rarely. The most recent example I could think of is Forge. And it has some interesting dynamics in that Forge was the target of Reddit, low float options, short squeeze. And so basically they took advantage of their stock being at elevated levels. And when their pipe went effective, they redeemed all of their warrants. The stock price immediately fell all the way down to sub 10 even. And so if you're sitting there with a warrant that's exercisable at eleven fifty, you're not going to exercise it. And so all of their warrants basically expired worthless, which you could argue is a good outcome for the company and the equity holders because you get rid of that dilutive security, but obviously a pretty horrible outcome if you were involved in the warrants. So that's one set. Wait, Lewis, but so I thought the, you said you say they were redeemed or they didn't end up so being when, redeemed. When they're redeemed, basically what happens is the company says you have 30 days to exercise your warrant or it expires worthless. Now, if the stock price is steady and, you know, the stock's at 18 or $19, that doesn't matter. But because for Forge, it came at the same time as a key negative technical catalyst, which was their pipe registering. So all of a sudden the float, you know, grew, you know, significantly. 
And so just think about simple supply and demand. The supply just went up massively. And so it crushed the stock. And so if the stock is trading below 1150, you're not going to pay 1150 to exercise it. And so basically what they were able to do, another way to say it is they were able to shorten their five-year duration. And so they really killed the value of that derivative. Now, the other thing you, you see from time to time, and I will suspect you'll see more of this, is you'll see companies put out an exchange offer where they offer more, usually it's it's stock, but they want to redeem the warrants for stock. And so as soon as recently as last week, Perella Weinberg announced that they were going to redeem their warrants. And so, you know, they offered 0.2 shares of common stock for each warrant, which represented, you know, about $1.30. And to put that in perspective, that was a 70% premium to where the warrants had closed the day prior. Now, I always thought Perella warrants were cheap and I actually own them. And I was, you know, in this environment, I guess you should be grateful with a 70% winner in a given day. But, you know, I still thought these warrants were, were pretty cheap. But, you know, over the past, you know, since 2021, you've seen a handful of these. You've seen six of these exchange offers. And I just think you'll see more because as you think about high redemptions and low floats, well, one way to increase your float is to take out your warrants for equity. Um, and so it, it just makes a lot of sense to clean up your capital structure and, you know, and also help your float a little bit. And that'll pave the way down for index inclusion or, you know, one of the big pieces of pushback I'll get when I tell investors like, hey, there's some really interesting DSPACs, baby in the bathwater type stuff, have a look. And they'll say, well, it doesn't trade. So even if I like it, you know, I can't put on a position anyway. Well, this is a way to help that a little bit. And then how do you exercise a warrant? I know if you have a call or put option, you can just press exercise. Can you do that? Or do you have to sort of send a letter or just? So you, so assuming the warrant is exercisable, you have to tell your broker. Um, for I can tell you professionally, I my prime broker is Goldman Sachs. And so I get like a email from them constantly with what warrants are exercisable that I own and basically click a button. For personal, I use Schwab. And in the past, you know, right now, Anything that's a SPAC that could be in the fund, I keep in the fund. I don't, I try not to cross any lines like that. But in the past, you know, I would, you get a notification, you get a notification if it was forced redemption because you have to take action. And if it wasn't a forced redemption, you could call them and speak to their, uh, one of their desks and their, their corporate actions desk and they'll take care of it for you. Mm, right. Lewis, you said earlier that shorting SPACs, it may seem attractive but it's very, very difficult. And, you know, Lewis, a lot of times on this podcast, I talk about things that I don't invest in actively. Like, you know, I'm not actively trading Euro dollar futures or I'm not, I don't have long or short currency positions, but I have tried my hand at shorting SPACs and I, there've been good times and definitely bad times. So I'm very aware of the challenges that shorting SPACs have, especially once you get to be a, a large institutional investor such as yourself. So if I come to you and I say, hey, Lewis, the thing's about to de-SPAC, it's a real trash company, tons of debt, no profit. Let's short it. Why? Why would it not be as good of an opportunity as, as that? Sure. So, so let's talk about how a short would actually work, right? So, and keep in mind that recent redemption rates have been in the eighty percent range. So, you start off with that thesis, like, "Hey, this is a disaster." Like, look, the markets are down, all the comps are down, the business has maybe even deteriorated during the process. And you're excited because since the stock couldn't trade down because of the trust floor, that's your opportunity. So you'll say, this is great. I'm going to short this stock. So you put on your short. And then what happens is you effectively go through a blind period where between the time the trust floor is pulled, which is two days before the vote, and the vote, you actually don't know if you're short the stock or not. And so if the stock goes to eight, you don't know if you can cover it or not. And if the stock goes to 12, you don't know if you can short, you probably can't short more because there's usually no borrow during that window, but you don't know if like, oh, if you're worried that this thing's going to go to 15, can you cover it, you know, and take your losses or would you get net long? So really difficult to risk manage that. But then say you get onto the other side, right? You hold on to your short, you know, you've seen a lot of these short squeezes in SPAC land. And so what happens is, you know, investors will look at, low float names with options, with high short interest. I'm not smart enough to tell you how to figure out what squeezes, otherwise I'd be doing it myself. But you see these moves on completely non-fundamental reasons where 
a SPAC could go to 20 or 30 bucks. And so if you're short that from 10, you know, that's painful. And what happens along the way is your borrow gets increasingly expensive, if not pulled at all together. And so, you know, you can look at something like, you know, SST, which was Bill Foley's back. And this thing had 99% plus redemptions, short interest in options. And it ultimately traded up, I think, close to $30. And then once finally the pipe was registered, came crashing back down. And I think now it's under 10. And so, you know, you could have been right that, you know, you thought the asset was, I actually think it's an interesting asset, but that aside, you could have been right thinking like, okay, just based on these market dynamics, you know, this is a great short, but you got taken for a ride and lost a lot of money for completely non-fundamental reasons and reasons that are really hard to, you know, forecast or hedge against. And so for those reasons, it's gotten more complicated. Now, if you were to wound the clock a year ago, redemption levels were much lower. And so it was easier to, you know, I'm looking right now in July, 2021, the average redemption was about 45%. And so you didn't have as much of these, you know, low float situations. I was actually involved in one um, last summer. So this was personal before I launched the fund where kind of the same setup. Really, I was really excited for it. The SPAC went up to 15 um, just on a short squeeze because the redemptions were so high. And I think now it's maybe like three or four dollars. And unfortunately for me, at around 14, I had my borrow pulled. So even though I was right, I lost 40 percent on that position because of, you know, factors beyond my control, an environment where the redemption rate. And so that only gets harder and to continue to creep up. If, if you monitor deal closings on, say, Twitter, if there's one with like a 97% redemption rate or 98, they go crazy because they know they've, they've done this before. And again, you know, if you're a $200 million SPAC with, you know, 2% remaining a $4 million float, I, you give me a compliment calling me a large institutional investor. I'm, I'm far from it. But even for a, a not large institutional investor, and you look at a, you know, $4 million float, yeah. what am I supposed to do with that, right? I could buy $100,000 of it. And if it doubles, that's great. If it falls off a cliff, I'm stuck in an illiquid position. So it's just, it's hard to, unless you take a basket approach and it's really hard to, you know, have a, a real strong investment process to take advantage of that. Right. And the people who are squeezing these things, they are not apes. They are not Wall Street bet people who love the stock. They, they are much more, they're, they're professional. You know, they're, they're not, they're uh they love squeeze. They, they love squeezing things. They're very smart tactical investors, right? Like, there's, in my opinion, there's no wrong way to make money as long as it's legal, which this is. There's no wrong way, and they've realized that if we can corner the market, we can make this thing squeeze. And I think what they're doing is totally fine. What I don't understand is who hasn't learned their lesson and stays short these things, right? Like, short squeezes happen because of options creating a gamma squeeze or high shortage just creating a short squeeze. So for me. You know, in cases where there's no options, I struggle with, you know, exactly the reason I'm telling you why I won't do it. It's like you, you can learn your lessons. You can watch from the sidelines and see, like, who who needs to get involved in that. But, Lewis, so many deals have gone from, you know, $10 to $2 in a, in a week. Yeah, but you show me how many of those deals you've been able to secure borrow from 10 to 2. I don't think it's as yes, many, yeah. which is, again, it's frustrating because I always tell people my job is a fund that only invests in SPACs is to monetize the strategy in any way I can. And so when I see something like these things are all dropping like rocks, I should be able to monetize that. And I can't, you know, it's, it's obviously really frustrating. It's a, you know, it's a trade on the screen. It's just not an, an actionable trade in most cases. Yeah. You, you said it before. It's a, it's a, tr just because something's a trade on a screen doesn't mean it's a real opportunity in real life. Right. Like, uh, you know, this one comes up a lot because the, the Donald Trump SPAC you know, seems to the fact that it's still trading at a huge premium. So if you look at the Donald Trump SPAC, the warrants right now are trading at $7, right? Which means that you can, you know, $7 plus the strike price of eleven fifty means you can create these for eighteen fifty. And yet the common the last time I, I checked was in the 30s. And you would say, okay, well, why don't I buy the warrants and short the common all day? And then you'd say, well, let's play this out. I don't even know if there's borrow available for the common. At one point, the borrow for the common was, you know, triple digits. I don't know if this deal's going to close. If it closes, it probably still takes 60 days for the warrants to become exercisable and get registered, et cetera. 
And so I have all this uncertainty and high cost and risk of borrow. So on the screen, it looks great that you can buy something for, you know, it's an arbitrage. I'm buying for 18 and selling for 30. But in reality, you could actually lose money putting on that trade. So I, I interrupted you. You said the, the low risk opportunity is just owning the SPAC and then getting your money back. You could also own the unit where you own the SPAC and then the warrants. Uh, I don't know if you're finished with that. So, so tell us about yeah, that. No, no, and then so, what's so, the high risk? So we're finished with that, right? And so if I frame it, you know, the, the low risk case, you're trying to make, you know, three to 4%, maybe slightly more if they get a deal done sooner. Um, and, you know, that's kind of both your, you know, your base case, let's call it three and your upside case is maybe three and a half. You go into, you know, the units where your downside case is something like one, one and a half, but your upside case either was more like, let's call it five to six. And then the most speculative at all, highest risk is you just own the warrants, right? These, at the end of the day, units trade separately. So you can choose, you can own the common, the warrants and, you know, the warrants, like we said earlier, if they don't do a deal, and we could talk about the deal outlook because that's pretty important context. The warrants expire worthless. And so, you know, there's a real scenario, just like a call option. There's a real scenario where you buy this thing and it's worth zero at the end of the day. The flip side is if they do a good deal, it could be worth a couple of dollars. And so, and I'm not recommending any of these per se, but you can look right now and if there's a, you know, let's see right up. There are about 20 warrants that trade for under 10 cents. So if you want to play like a, a shoot for the moon strategy, you know, you, so there's, there's more, there's announced warrants actually, which is even worse. But, you know, if you want to shoot for the moon strategy, you can be buying these warrants for sub 10 cents. And if they, heaven forbid, actually do a good deal, they could be worth one to $2, right? And that's just a huge return on your money. Now, they're not so liquid. So you almost have to make that decision of, if I if I buy this warrant, I'm I'm ready to take it to zero or to fifty cents or a dollar or whatever. Um, but you know that's that's more exciting. It's more risky. If we were in um, early 2021, late 2020, I would be telling you that's all you should be looking at because the deal market was so hot that you had warrants trading at 10, 15, 20 bucks. I mean, I had some of my you know best trades ever in that environment, but. You know, the market has definitely changed right now. And so I've kind of been focused on, you know, the, the lower end. Maybe if there's a special situation, I'll look at a warrant, such as, you know, we've seen cases where the warrant gets amended because of, you know, deal structure. And so all of a sudden, instead of the strike price being 1150 it could be less. Instead of one warrant getting you one share of stock, it could be more. Sometimes you have both of those dynamics at play. Um, so for me, I, I really need more of a special situation because the risk is just heightened. And so I try to stay kind of the lower end of the risk factor. But if you, you know, if, if you want to get, um, you know, really excited, built up and you decide like, Hey, there's some really tier one sponsors out there, like KKR, Apollo, Churchill, like I'll take a flyer on them. They're the best investors in the world. And, you know, as long as you designate that in your high risk bucket, I think those could be kind of interesting. Right. And I just want to emphasize that just as a SPAC is completely different before and after it, it despacs, a warrant of a despatch company is kind of like an option. Whereas a warrant of a SPAC, uh, you know, the deal might not happen. So it could be worth zero. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Lewis, tell us a little bit of the strategies that, that you employ. You talk about buy rights. You talk about SPAC arbitrage. What are those? Sure, so we, we, haven't, of... we haven't talked about buy rights on this call, but, you know, what I'm doing right now in my fund is, you know, kind of what I was saying before, buying some SPACs for yield. But instead of just buying them to try to make 3 to 4%, what I'll look for is scenarios where a SPAC has announced a deal already and the market is basically pricing in that the deal doesn't close. And so the SPAC still trades at that 3% median yield to liquidation. But in reality, liquidation could be making this up, but a year and a half away. And if the deal actually closes, it's four months away. So all of a sudden I can make that same, you know, 30, 40 cents in a few months instead of, you know, over 18 months. And all of a sudden my annualized return is much higher without assuming more downside. So for me in this market full of volatility, that's, that's the ideal trade. I still have a couple of SPAC arbitrage trades where, you know, like I was saying before, you know, the 
the Aries of the world, the Apollos, the Barry Sternlicks, like if those guys don't do deals, it will be because they choose not to do deals, not because they can't find them or finance them. You know, Apollo obviously has hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. So if they need to raise a pipe, no problem. They actually have a SPAC dedicated fund. Um, so does CC Newberger, who just closed their deal with Getty earlier this week. And so there are some sponsors that I would say have a higher likelihood than others of getting the deal done. So those are two strategies. Another one that you alluded to is buy rights. So in a buy right, you'll buy a SPAC and you'll write a three month forward call option against it. It's the same concept as buying for yield, except you are enhancing the yield by that call option. And so one of two things happen at the expiration of that option, either the SPAC is trading above 10 and you get exercise out of your position, or it's below 10 and the option expires worthless and whatever you wrote that for, say 10, 15 cents, you've made that profit and you'll look to rinse and repeat. So for me, those are the those are the core strategies for me. They account for 99% of my capital. The other 1% is, you know, some of those more special situations, uh, warrant events that I've mentioned to you. Maybe there's a warrant arbitrage. It's almost that other bucket. Uh, and so, but the vast majority is in those, uh, the ARB and the buy rights. And Lewis, how would you characterize the investment base of SPAC holders? If in 2020 and 2021, there was a lot of retail investors who would not redeem and they, they end up holding a DSPAC that either shot up in value or you know more likely collapsed, uh, how many investors are like you where they're you know sophisticated, uh, either a large institutional investor like you or they're sophisticated, a, a sophisticated small retail investor and they actually are redeeming. They're actually sending their brokerage uh, say, hey, I want to redeem because some of the redemptions on th these uh, SPACs have just skyrocketed. So, and also, you know, this is more of a philosophical question, but what, is the, what does that mean for the SPAC world if 90% of people who own the SPACs do not want to do a deal? So... I think you're exactly right that, you know, when we were back in, you know, 2020, 2021, SPACs were announcing deals and they were flying, right? And so I think everyone was flocking to them, hedge funds, mutual funds. I mean, Fidelity was involved in a lot of pipes, uh, retail, and, you know, it, it made perfect sense. You were buying these things at the time for somewhere between 10 and $11 if you couldn't get in on the IPO. And when they announced a deal, they were going to... 15, 16, 17. And so you look at that from a risk reward standpoint and you would say a dollar down, six dollars up. That's fantastic. If you were actually able to get these at the IPO where it's, you know, 10 bucks plus your warrant, you would say you'd be telling your boss, like, worst case scenario, we, you know, we make no money. Best case scenario, we make, you know, with the warrant 70, 80 percent, you know, that's going to attract everyone. And so you saw everyone flock to the product. You know, it's hard for larger institutions to build warrant portfolios, but a lot of retail investors flock to the warrants. I was one of them. Um, but that's all gone now, right? So back then, you know, the average back at one point was trading at 11 bucks, then it would announce a deal and go to 14. And, you know, so the warrants would go from, you know, trading at like two or three to going to six. Um, and so it was easy to get excited. Now you look at it and everything's trading below trust. The median warrant right now trades at something like 12 cents for before they announce a deal, 20 cents after they do. And so those, you know, exciting risk re reward is not there anymore. And so, you know, my strategy is way too boring for retail and too time intensive, you know, for your standard hedge fund that, you know, still tells their investors are aiming to put up 20%. They can't, you know, go into a strategy that best case puts up five to six before leverage when they're, you know, in theory, invest in other equities with much higher price targets. And so you've really cleaned out the market to a lot of, you know, people like me and also fixed income investors. And so one of the challenges is in theory, there is supposed to be a natural handoff between the ARB investors or the fixed income investors and the fundamental investors when a deal is announced. And that is how you go from, you know, $10 to 12, right? For me, I'm incented to hold my, um, you know, hold my SPAC until I can get my trust value back. So if, if trust is 10 and the stock's trading at 10.05, then I should really be selling it and, you know, rinsing and repeating with my capital unless I want to take a fundamental view. And so that's not happening. And that's one of the reasons redemptions are so high. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons, but 
But that's a long way of saying I think the main investors right now are fixed income and ARP type funds. Fixed income investors. So like they have a billion dollars and they allocate some percentage of it to SPACs instead of owning bonds. Right. That's, that's interesting. What's interesting is the, compa- the comparison people make are to fixed income, right? At the end of the day, a SPAC in their trust account owns treasuries, and yet you could earn higher return by owning the SPAC instead of owning those treasuries outright. But when I look at it, you actually earn the same or higher yield owning SPACs as you do earn owning like A and double A bonds. And so in that case, you're getting the same or slightly better yield, but with a better credit profile and a shorter duration in most cases. And so, you know, I've been trying to pitch certain corporates in their treasury department to say, you know, don't own $10 million of treasuries for, you know, sub one year duration, own 10 million of SPACs. And by the way, for those who care, you actually get better tax treatment because if you buy one year SPACs, it's long-term capital gains instead of, you know, ordinary interest expense. Um, really? You know, it hasn't been that successful just because um, if you think about the treasurer at a company who's overseeing $10 million and you tell them they can get an extra half a percent, they're going to say, well, if anything goes wrong, I lose my job. And if I ain't earn that extra half yeah. a percent, I'm not seeing any of it. So thanks, but no, but no thanks. Yep. And so at no point do you own the equity. Do you, you own the T-SPACs. You only own the SPACs. I mean, I, I, I own personally one or two, but in the fund, that's not part of the strategy. No. Got it. Um, it's just a, it's a very different volatility profile. You do own the warrants sometimes, but that's hedged by being short the SPAC or something. No. So I'll own the warrants if, you know, let's say I own the units into the deal closing. And so I'll split it into the stock and the warrants and I'll, you know, I'll sell my, or I'll redeem the common and I'll hold on to those warrants. Sometimes you're waiting for a liquidity type event or liquidity across the board has really dried up for SPACs. And so you want to pick your moments and when you, uh, Pick your moments and when you sell. Like I'll give you an example. A broker pinged me a few months ago saying, "Hey, I, I've got a guy who's like getting out of his SPAC book and he wants to sell his warrants in a deal that announced for ten cents." I was like, "Okay, I've, I've actually studied this deal. I've spoken to the the SPAC and the sponsor. I feel pretty good about them, you know, being mutually incentivized to close the deal. I think the sponsor adds value to the target. Kind of all the things you want to look for for thinking will the deal close." And you're like, "All right, for ten cents." I'll take them. At the time, your average warrant at deal close was trading uh, 90 cents to a dollar. So I was like, all right, obviously this guy doesn't think the deal's closing. He's a four seller. Or, you know, in a lot of cases, it's such a small position. You know, it's like throwing, you know, a nickel out of your pocket. You just don't think twice about it. And I just thought, I'm buying this. It could be a, an eight to nine bagger. Um, and I'll happily take that. Right. So there's, but now on the flip side, so that deal closes, it's not so liquid. So, if I want to sell it, I have to be pretty methodical about how I want to sell it. But getting in at 10 cents, you feel like your margin of, of safety is pretty comfortable. But I would say that, you know, that's that's a one off position as opposed to, as I mentioned, you know, that's in that one percent bucket of capital for me. Right. Um, and then there are options on the SPAC. Tell us, do you ever you're, you, you said you sometimes you do a buy right. So you sell calls or sell the call spread on the SPAC. But. Tell us what is the pricing of the calls versus the puts. You know, typically a ten dollar call and a ten dollar put might have the same implied volatility, but that is not the case. So, it, so it really Spacks. depends on the phase of the SPAC's life. So, if you look at, you know, I would say if you look at SPACs that have not announced a deal yet, the volatility in recent weeks have, has really fallen out. Um, so, I've I've been I still look for them, but they're not as easy to find those opportunities. But, you know, ideally what you would look for is you want to buy a SPAC and write, you know, a one month forward option for call it, you know, close as close to 10 cents as possible, right? And if you think about 10 cents, you're making a percent in a month, you know, a little over 12% annualized risk-free. That's a, that's a home run trade to me. If, you know, if it ends up being eight cents or seven cents, that's fine and dandy. Um, and so that's kind of the lowest risk because you know that if they announce a deal tomorrow, it's probably a four month minimum to closing the deal. And so if I'm writing one month call options, I don't have to worry about that. So then the next part would be a SPAC that has announced a deal, but not set a vote date yet. So the risk here is when a SPAC sets its vote date and closes and becomes a D SPAC, the volatility profile is very different, right? It's like what we discussed, you're literally going from 
a low risk fixed income instrument, aka low volatility to a high risk equity. And so you could be short, you know, call options at 10, 20 cents that quickly go up, up to 80 cents. And so obviously you want to try to avoid those. And so it's kind of similar. You'll look at this and say, okay, the deal announced yesterday, I feel pretty good going two months, two and a half months forward, but don't really want to be too greedy. And, and you can usually get, you know, a little bit of juice if it's a popular name. Again, liquidity in the entire complex is really decreased. So it's, it's case by case. And then the riskier ones are, they've set a date already. And so maybe you want to say, you know, back to that, how do you short these things? You'll say, okay, this is going to be, this is really juicy. Let me get shorted. But the problem in a lot of those scenarios is the option market is smart. And so we were talking about, um, you know, founder shares, founders back. And I'm just trying to pull this up now, but my guess is, you know, if you want to buy the $10 puts, they're probably a dollar or an excess thereof. And for one month, you know, forward expiration. So it's, it's quite the premium to pay um, to take that bet. And so, sure, we've seen plenty of SPACs fall 50% week one, but we've also seen them squeeze 50% week one. So it it definitely makes it a little more. So, and sorry, I, I was way off. The um, the ask on the founder puts $10 for August are $2.40. So, you know, the, the idea of looking an investor in the eye and saying, hey, I invested... <laughs> I bought puts at 240, that's 24% of the price. And I was right, but I lost money because it only fell 20. You know, it's, it's hard to be yeah, overly yeah. precise. And by the way, the bid ask spread is 160 by 240. So your ability to, you know, mon even if you're right, your ability to monetize that could be limited. I'm gonna take a guess that the calls, $10 calls for August are less than 240. Oh yeah, the, uh, the bid ask is 75 by 110. So again, you could say like, oh, there's no borrow, but why don't we just write the 10s naked? And that's fine, except for the fact that, you know, you could get squeezed and it goes to 14. That and there's no volume on a day like today and the open interest is only 289. So, you know, the, the idea that you can be overly tactical with these at an institutional level is, is just not the case. Yeah. So Lewis, if, you know, let's say you own a treasury, the treasury pays you 2%, the investor makes 2%. And they get that from the government. When you buy a SPAC and you redeem it, you make 4%. Who are you getting that 4% from? Usually it's the sponsor. So the sponsor now, when they fund their SPAC, they have to put up, you know, let's call it an extra 20 cents in the SPAC. And so we were talking before that to launch a SPAC, it used, the rule used to be 2% plus 2 million, right? So, you know, 6 million bucks on a $200 million SPAC. Well, now it's probably 2 million plus 6%. And so you're putting up a lot more money because you have to kind of give me as a fixed income inve investor that baseline return. And so two of the reasons why, in my opinion, you've seen SPAC IPOs all but stop is one, they're a lot more expensive. Again, you know, you're, you're putting up that extra 20 cents. And two, the deal outlook is uncertain given the combination of market volatility and the SEC still hasn't finalized their their SPAC rules. Lewis, as we approach a close, for anything you want to leave the audience with? Um, you know, the only thing I'd say is, you know, SPACs are really relying on M&A. M&A is really cyclical um, during periods of market volatility. M&A across the board, whether it's strategic sponsor or SPACs, it always slows down. So we're kind of sitting at this really challenging part of the cycle where you have these negative cyclical dynamics towards M&A. You have negative sentiment towards, you know, SPACs and you have, you know, this uncertainty around um, the SEC. So if you ask me right now, we're at the low. And so because of that, if you can find some pretty interesting things to invest in, you know, again, depending on your risk parameter, do you want to go, you know, highest risk in warrants or do you want to do something with maybe the SPAC arbitrage or the units? You know, if you're right, you're going to, you should have some pretty nice returns on the other side. I mean, it's always those deals done at the cycle lows that pay the biggest. So, Well, Lewis, it's been a pleasure uh, having you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jack. It's been great. Hope we can do this soon. There is something that you need to be doing right now, and that is reading the BlockWorks daily newsletter. For top market insights and the latest in crypto news, you have to subscribe to the BlockWorks daily newsletter, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to this video or by visiting blockworks.co forward slash newsletter.